All right, starting over. Um, so, um, tell us who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So my name's Steven. I'm gonna talk about uh, some best practices in um, in dancer. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Oftentimes, I want to talk about best practices, but it's easier for me to talk about bad practices because people tend to do the wrong thing, and then I have to correct them. So it's easier to present the good things after I go over the bad things, because they are always an alternative. Um, in December, we spent uh, time working on the Dancer Advent Calendar. So I ended up writing 23 out of 24 articles, and most of them actually focused on the right way of doing things, some features that people don't know about, how to use them correctly, and so on and so on. Of course, at least one person came up to me and said, it was too long, I didn't read it. And then they asked, could you just do a talk about it instead, because I don't want to read them. So I said, okay, Pasna. And, <laughs> and that's why I'm here doing a talk. So uh, I'm going to go over the seven deadly sins, uh, stuff that, I, that people commonly do that I kind of want you to give you, give you kind of insight on, you know, don't do this, do this instead. And there's a, probably a few more horrible things in the wild that I'm not aware of, but these are the big things that came up to me the other day. And um, if there's anything that you cover, come over after and tell me, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll have them do the next one and see how I can make it into nine deadly sins. So, the first one, simply put, using Dancer 1, uh, the older version. Um, Dancer 1 was the first uh, version of Dancer, and then we forked it off, we rewrote it, and it's now Dancer 2. Um, there's Amon 2 in Pearl, there's Mongrel 2. So things that start with two is nothing new. But we did want to separate completely from the old code base so we don't cause uh, breakage, compatibility problems, backwards issues, um, adding features, duplicating code, and so on and so on. So we just created a new, um, a new namespace. Problems with uh, the old version. There is no separation of the DSL. So you can't easily add keywords without taking into account the entire implementation at the same time. With the answer to that's not a problem because there's a different separate layer only for representing keywords. All the rest is implemented in the core, in objects and in methods that are then componentized and used together. There is a hand rolled object system, which is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Um, and the answer two uses Moo, which is a stripped down, mostly compatible version of Moose. Unfortunately, we would love to use Moose, unfortunately it's it's a bit big um, the dependencies and, and it even uses a little bit of excess and Dancer 2 tries to be pure Perl, so... Uh, there's also a single shared state, uh, which means that every request goes in to this big hash that contains the current state, which is... It's literally <coughs> called shared data. And that kind of introduced this global issue with a bunch of these things that we call engines. So if you're using a serializer, a session, engine, uh, if you have a logger or a template, they're all the same everywhere across your entire process. Any change to one is a change to all. This is the original design of Sinatra, where we took the answer from in support of that. Um, there is a multi-app dispatcher, basically meaning that there's one dispatcher for every application that was loaded, every code that was loaded. If I loaded in the same process two pieces of code that relate to different things and they both have uh, routes, both of them will be loaded into one big dispatcher. You can't get away from it. Uh, and that introduces a bunch of problems with security, with the consistency, uh, sanity. They're all lost. All of them went to hell. So the solution is pretty simple, use the answer to instead, the syntax is 99% the same except for some new features. So yes, um, send number two. This is a common pattern that we see all the time. People implement um, an about page. So they have get, about, and it runs a template called about. Then they say, well now I have another page, so okay, I'll, I'll do that too. So we have the profile page and uh, we have this archives page as well. And we ended up adding more and more uh, code that basically just serves a template with the same name. There's different ways of solving it. People have tried plenty of them. A few of them are using a variable, simply uh, having a placeholder there and calling it the template. So um, the template is called on the param keyword that returns a single element 
from what it caught um, as a placeholder. That means that the page that, if you go to slash fill, it will get foo. This is actually pretty good because if you do serve more than one variable in there, like slash foo and a question mark foo equals something, it will still get the first one only, which is pretty good. Um, so this will not be a problem. Um, you can see that there's foo for the page, and then there's page as a variable, and technically param goes to all of them, but in this specific case, it will limit itself to just one. So that's not a problem. Another way of doing this is to call params. Params returns more than one. Params limited to a single parameter. Params is for parameters in plural, so it reaches more than one. And that returns a hash ref um, with all the variables in it. What we do here is that we call params with the route, basically saying I would like to limit the parameters that I receive to what you got from the routing definition, which means the page. So if someone says a variable in the uh, query string, that's not going to return any of those. If someone returned a parameter in the content, it's going to ignore that. It's taking all of, only things that it caught from the route definition matching. And after that, we go into the hash ref and we get page, which is the key. So far, so good. Then we get to slash about slash us. The plot thickens. So now we have two placeholders. That, that's, that's not going to fail, and that totally, totally scales to every situation we'll have in the future. Um, so now what we do is use params and then dereference it, and then go and get two keys, and then we join them, and then, yeah, that's, that's totally safe. Um, <clears throat> people have another way, um, this is a bit better. What this does is use um, the star star that basically says, give me all of them and split them for me by slashes. And then they run splat, that returns an array ref, and then you can join that array ref. And then, this is really nice, except uh, this uh, star star is also called the mega splat, which is super greedy. Mm -hmm. And what it does is take everything, which means that it's kind of like matching every possible path. So if you put this in the wrong place, none of the other paths are going to match, because this is going to match instead. So you've got to make sure that it's always at the end, and people never do. So, okay, stepping back from this, what we actually have is a very simple logic here. The first question that we have is, is this a matching route? If it isn't, can we match a template to this? If we can, we just have a 404. Very, very simple logic that most people over-engineer, and the solution is very really simple. We just use a feature called AutoPage. Turning it on might be tricky, but if you remember this incantation, you will succeed. Okay? It says auto page one. All right, moving on. Okay, so here. Yes. I hope it's not too much of a blasphemy mentioning other languages or other platforms here. But I mean, it is. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, uh, coming from Ruby. We have, uh, and, and especially uh, Rails, you have the uh, convention over configuration. And this seems, the previous one, number two, seems like a great example of that, uh, where, you, where you just, where the framework can just take care of that instead of doing all sorts of manipulations on yes. this. So, can that be considered let one? me take that into account. Okay. This, this is it. Oh, okay. If I were to turn this on by default, basically without you necessarily knowing, especially if you're a beginner who's not aware of this feature, I am now submitting all of your templates automatically. You probably don't want that. That is a major security risk. I know that a lot of languages don't care about that, but to us the default would be don't do something the person doesn't know about. Um, but this is a core implementation. So this is a handler that will run at the end and serve it for you automatically if it couldn't find a route to match and if there is a template that reaches whichever structure you have there in the path. Okay? Um, almost, but it's a probably not. Okay, would you prefer that be default? Because it's not going to happen. No, 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 that's not what I meant. Okay, then after. Yeah. Alright, moving on to the next uh, thing. Prefix. Uh, I love prefix. Um, uh, usually what people do with prefix to set, to shorten the way, the amount that they would write for each path, is to have an app get, then they set a prefix, special. They write everything else that they want, 
this rural lake to special, and then they undef the prefix to clean it up. You can do that. But this is bad. And the reason that we need a solution for this is that you have to set it and then undef it, and what if someone put in after, what if someone put before, what if you forget to undef, it becomes a mess. So there's, there is a solution, you can still use prefix, but you can use prefix the way we want it to be used, which is lexically. You call prefix and you give it a sub. So prefix keyword, then the path that you want to prefix, from this point on, a sub, and everything that goes inside it will be relative to special. <coughs> Much simpler. You finish the sub, it cleans up automatically. Sure. All right, next setting. Um, monolithic applications. I hate this. And I see this all the time. I get to spend a lot of time cleaning up after uh, code that does this. It, it tends to be a single file, uh, roughly <coughs> 4,000 lines, sometimes more, uh, with everything in it. So it's going to have all the routes, it's going to have uh, all of the administration code in it, it's going to have the API inside of it, it's pretty much going to have everything. Um, it's going to have the, a bunch of hacks, uh, because now you have to have those hacks, because it's all in one big file, and then you didn't even use the prefix correctly, and then you forgot the prefix somewhere, and you have all these checks, and it's just terrible, it is not good. So, there is a way to solve it. Dancer2 has a concept called Dancer Apps. When you have a package. This becomes an app, what we call a dancer app. This means that everything underneath relates only to that. So if we have an app, and now we have another app, they have different packages. That means that each one is its own separate application. And you can have, you can separate your code into multiple of these components and applications, which is very nice. Now, um, a lot of people look at this and say, well, actually, you want a prefix here, so that way admin is always on admin, but we can make it a bit clearer, so we'll take these prefix and we'll move it to what we saw before. Now we have an admin that has an admin slash admin, it's very nice, and um, it introduces a problem. When we have two applications, in this case, my app and my app admin, they are, because there are two applications, you can't serve to the web server two applications. You have to only serve one application. So what we can do with this is, if you take a look at my app and my app admin, because they are actually part of the same package, they're supposed to be under the same roof. Um, yeah, this is how a handler would look like, I'm sorry. Um, I wrote most of these today. Um, but basically, a, a handler, if we have a PSGI handler that you, loads both and calls two app and both, this is a problem because it will generate two web applications, like I said. So this is a problem. We, we can only show one of them. So the, the first thing that we can do is use Plaque Builder over here. It provides us with the builder keyword. Then we have a code block, and then we can use mount with a path and the application that it has to hit. So slash will go to my app, slash admin will go to my app admin. At this point, the prefix is no longer necessary because this will provide the prefix behavior. And the builder will return a single app that basically routes to the right one. So we now separate everything. But the question that we get from this is, well, what if they're part of the same thing? I don't want to separate them. I actually want them to be one file that have split to multiple files. I don't want to have a package and a package and a package and then builder on each one and then mounting each one separately it becomes an issue because sometimes it's just one big app. We can do that too. That's not a problem. If we take a look at this code, all we need to do is add app name and call my app. And when you do this, Dancer says, no problem, I'm just extending this thing over here top. So I'm just going to add this code over there. As if you wrote it in one big file, but you separate it into multiple files. Same thing. Which is a really good thing. Most people don't know about this, don't use it properly. It's a shame. And the handler becomes the symbol, because now everything is under my app, so we just call to app on that. Done. Very simple. Next big sin. Uh, I, I, this is a big annoyance, uh, especially recently, um, because we corrected a few behaviors that we were very lenient about before, and it broke a lot of stuff for people that just didn't care and didn't know about the differences, and I spent about two weeks cleaning up code in the company. so. 
All right. Um, mixing content types. This is uh, something that I generally hate in web. It's not a dancer thing, it's a web thing. People serve multiple content types, but it's all in the same big application. Um, you have a page that returns HTML, and you have an API that returns JSON or XML or whatever else you have for encoding and serialization. These are different things. Mainly, these are different content types. Even if they're strings, they're used differently. A JSON will be interpreted. A string will be displayed. So, there's a difference. In Dancer, because you can separate the different apps, this produces um, a solution for the situation. So, taking a look at this code, which I definitely should resize next time. Um, we have a, an app here, my app. It has a get. It has an index uh, template that it renders. And then we have another piece of code that sets the content type to JSON and returns whatever encode JSON returns. Now, if you take a look at template and encode JSON, they return different content types. One returns HTML, which is just an HTML string. The other one returns a JSON string, which is then analyzed. Different things. I see this all the time. Um, of course, we're going to use a prefix here, because a prefix makes it easier. Now, if we use a package here, by separating these to two different things, each package is assured to always return <coughs> the same type. Um, a handler, of course, to load both of them, just like we did before when we had two different apps. Um, one thing that we can do is kind of clean up the uh, monolithic structure of this, because this tends to happen when you have a big API. You'll have your API, it has users and stories, and oftentimes you'll put all of them in the same one. Every entity, all of them go into API PM or whatever it is you have. So if we separate it again, um, we have users and stories, all of these are packages. Now instead of two packages, one for the main app, one for API, we have main app, API, and then users and stories and all of those. So we kind of generate a ton of packages instead, and a ton of different apps. What we can do is take API users and stories, of course, all of them, uh, we can give them all prefixes, and then we can take all of these packages that actually relate to the same thing, an API, and use app name in order to bind them to the main class. Suddenly, we're back to two applications. My app and my app API. My app API, we just need to add these two lines, it will automatically load all the other stuff that bind back to it to provide additional paths specifically for users and specifically for stories. This is a clean structure. You have two uh, dancer applications, each providing its own thing, and the API has additional extensions that bind back. And they're all running on prefix, so inside the prefix it's slash and so on. So, the two lines that we have. The handler once we do this, in order to handle the, both of them together and produce one big app from the API and the web, and we mount them, the prefix for slash API is no longer needed. So, yeah. Six, we're down to just two. So, that's good. The sixth sin, sin um, misusing serializers. I love serializers, everyone misuses them. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame. Serializers are super useful if you use them correctly. Um, a problem that we had with uh, recent versions is that, other than Skype, um, a problem that we had with recent versions is that uh, previously, um, because the serializers <coughs> didn't have their JSON, YAML, and data dumper, which are just common, um, none of them work on non refs, like on strings. Most of them work on references, JSON specifically, just references. And the code that we had basically said, well, if it's not a reference, just return it. Otherwise, allow it to be automatically serialized to a certain format. Then uh, someone wanted to add uh, CBOR serialization. Uh, serialization. CBOR is a compact binary format. And when I wrote the code for it, the test failed. The test failed because CBOR can actually serialize strings as well. So suddenly, our code was, well, if your serializer supports strings, then it's screwed. Otherwise, we'll do it, unless it's a string, and then we ignore it, and then return it. 
and it caused a really weird situation. Um, and once I cleaned that up and we changed it to serializers always try to serialize your data, we found out that a lot of people have this weird habit of saying, I will either return HTML or return a structure that I expect to be automatically serialized. And then you get a situation where the app is not consistent. And people argued against this. And I said, well, your, your application asked everything to be serialized. And they say, yes, accept this HTML. I want you to ignore it. All right. So people misuse this. And there is a really easy way to solve it. You just, again, separate applications. Let's take a look at some code. Uh, we have this get that sets the content type and encodes JSON. And we can replace these lines by simply using a serializer, right? The serializer will set the content, it says set serializer JSON. What it will do is set the content type and encode it automatically. Everything. And then everything that you have that doesn't need to be serialized, put it in a separate, a separate app, of course. And the last thing that I have, um, sim, sim, coupled applications. It is very frustrating. A lot of the stuff that I showed is separating things to applications, but people do this thing all the time. That's why I have to repeat it, because they do it in different ways, and then I always have to return to that structure. Seemingly, an application has just the web application. But that's not actually true. In reality, most applications have their web application, and their application core. <coughs> Two different things. One is an interface to it, and one is the actual core. Um, the actual core will do stuff like going to the databases, getting objects, running methods. The web interface just shows it. Whether you show it in an API, or whether you show it on pages, or whether you show it in both by having two apps bound together. You're just representing the data. Just like a command line client, is just a tool to access, it's an interface to the core. If you've ever worked on command line utilities, you've probably seen command line utilities that you can't take out of the command line. So people write web interfaces that run shell commands. It happens, because, exactly because of this. These are different things, that's why they should have different apps. The way to do this is to do this thing called the complete. I usually tend to have uh, my app and my app web, where web is where I store all of the web specific things. And my app is where I actually have the core functionality. But then I tend to have my app web API as well, where I have the web pages and I have the actual API endpoints. And oftentimes the API grows and grows, so I'll have classes for each one. So I'll have this thing where I have the API users and I have the API stories and I have and so on and so on and so on and so on. So, we'll utilize everything that we did so far in order to cleanly make all of these available in the same way. First thing that we do is have these two apps, uh, app web, my app web, my app um, API, and what you'll notice is that each one, oh, actually, we'll leave it. Second one. Uh, the API loads two other ones, so like we did, they use app name to bind back. So it's actually only two dancer applications on four classes. And then it uses um, my app, I'll turn back here, it instantiates my app in order to access the entire core application in an object. Then we combine all of them together and we create a web interface to two classes, two applications, one of them loading two extensions, and they can use the app core using some kind of object. There's ways to improve this. Um, one of the ways that I like is to have a setup method, or setting up a setup setup method. It looks like this. Uh, we have the basic uh, handler, and what we do is we use my app, we create our own object, and then we send that instance to each one of the other web classes. And then they can play with it in the story. It will be the same instance. I've used this often for setting up schemas, and then I can do tests on stuff, which is super useful. So we create the MyApp instance. We call setup on each, sending everything inside it. And after all of this, 
I don't actually have anything. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, this is a good time uh, to say thank you and to ask if you have any questions. This stands for questions. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Scared shitless. Yes. I think it was uh, point five where you mentioned that one application serves different type of information, like different content types. Is there? Possibly. I mean, I understand. Okay, I understand that uh, for like a bigger project, it's, it's good to separate these things. But if you have just something small, is there something wrong for one application to serve different content types? Well, uh, so you have two options. One is to set for each different route, the content type, because it wouldn't be a global content type. Yeah. So we would have to override it locally every single time. Mm -hmm. The other one is that uh, you, would, you could set up a serializer. But if you set up a serializer, it's for all of it. So you're going to have to set it up separately. Eventually, it becomes, if you have two types of content types, it always pays off to have two uh, applications, each one handling its own content type. Okay. Is there any problem in overriding content type locally in every, in every method I want to override it? Other than repeating yourself, room for errors, copy pasting problems, and non ha having code that is um, non-readable because you don't understand why it does that, and people can you know, obviously copy paste wrongly, no, it's totally fine. Uh, but for all these reasons, I would never do this. I generally think that when you open uh, a context, you should be being assured that this app will always return the same type, lets you know that it always re uh, works with the same kind of, uh, the same client or in the same context. And that, that gives you much more clarity, you're not afraid of people copy pasting by mistake, adding by mistake, forgetting a line, adding from a different place, it's, it's assured. And you don't have to repeat yourself every time to override in certain contexts. Um, also, I didn't put this in, but if you do this in any of my code, I will get really, really angry, which is check for a parameter and optionally return a different type of uh, content type. Then I get really mad. If you check for a parameter and say, well, now I'll return XML. No, don't do this. Have an endpoint that is assured to return XML so I can trust it and not check all the time. Um, any other questions? Great. We'll have a, I think, a five-minute break at this point, and then we'll continue.